Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. This is James Ortega with FIAS. Uh, we've got about two thirds of our, our people here, so I'm going to give a brief introduction um, and then I'll turn it over to our fantastic presenters we have today. So, today's webinar is Spaghetti Carbonara Disentangling Operational and Embodied Carbon. Our presenters will be David Solomon, Steve Hessler, and Ilka Cassidy. This is going to be a, a one hour webinar. It's going to be recorded. Um, so all registrants will have access to the recording afterwards um, via a follow-up email. Um, so this one hour webinar does qualify for CPHC CEUs. So right now, if you can sh see the screen, um, it, it is telling you the self-report code and how many CEUs this is worth. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within the week um, with a certificate and reporting information for your records. Um, if you take a look at the control panel on the side of your screen, um, please feel free to type a question into the question box on the right. Um, we may be able to answer a few questions if time allows at the end of the webinar. If time does not allow and there are some really good pertinent questions, we will be sure to try and answer those um, and send out the answers um, with the, with the follow-up email later in the week. So David, Steven, and Ilka, thank you very much for presenting today. Um, feel free to start whenever you're ready and please go ahead and introduce yourselves so we can recognize your voices as, as you guys come in and talk. All right, James, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you everybody um, out there for joining us. Uh, really excited to um, do this webinar. My name is David Solomon. Uh, I work with Revision Architecture. We design high performance and sustainable buildings. And we also consult um, to other architects and uh, engineers, developers, et cetera. Uh, we consult on a, on a wide range of um, uh, sustainability criteria. Uh, we do a lot of passive house consulting. We consult for, uh, we have a lot of lead consulting projects, well sites, living building challenge, um, et cetera. And um, I just, uh, I, my colleagues, Steve and Ilka are going to introduce themselves in a moment. I just want you all to know that we are, of course, in three separate places. And I have control of the slide deck, but we're all going to be talking. And so uh, chances are good that I might either advance a slide before I should or, um, or lag a little bit behind. So just ask you all to bear with us um, as we do this uh, from remote locations. Yes, hi, I'm, David, I'm give Ilka. me one sec. Okay. Give me one sec, Ilka. Sorry, guys. I, I uh -huh. see there's a couple questions out here that say there's there's no audio. Is anyone else having issues with not hearing the audio? I'm hearing both of you fine. Christopher, are you hearing everybody as well? Yes, I can hear everybody as well. Okay, just checking. It looks like I got a bunch of affirmatives that the audio is fine. Just making sure. Thank you. Go, go ahead, Ilka. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, so I'm Ilka Cassidy. Um, I am principal of C2 Architecture um, and also Holcom System, which uh, I founded with uh, Steve Hessler. I'm an architect. I uh, went to school in Germany and um, started my own practice here um, a while ago and have been interested in um, you know, passive health and pass passive health consulting for a while. And um, yeah, I guess up to you, Steve. Now, hi, I'm I'm Steve Hessler. Um, I am a um, timber frame uh, and structural designer and a project manager for high performance homes, um, and currently um, really focused on Holtrum systems. So, Oak and I um, started the Holtrum system to kind of create a bridge for. Uh, people looking to do passive home, passive house um, with off-site manufacturing um, capabilities. So that's that's kind of what we do. We we've we've sort of filled that void between design intent and um, a passive house manufacturing um, option. Currently, mostly working with Blueprint Robotics. Thank you both. So um, passive house, as I think 
you know, everybody is aware is, a, is, is really a tool to combat global climate change by reducing operational energy in our buildings and thereby reduce harmful carbon emissions. Uh, however, as a system, uh, Passive House really only focuses on operational energy, not embodied energy. And we wanted to understand the effect of embodied energy and the resulting embodied carbon footprint so that we could uh, really begin to gauge if our projects are, are helping the environment or hurting it and how we can continue to improve. And so what do we mean when we talk about carbon, right? Uh, carbon is a convenient, if somewhat imprecise term for a whole host of different climate changing gases, right? Embodied carbon obviously comes from the manufacture, transport, and installation of construction materials, whereas operational carbon is gonna come from building energy consumption. So sometimes we write this at ECO2E or OCO2E, the, the first E is for embodied and the O is for operational. Uh, the second E, the small E, stands for equivalent. And uh, that's because we use carbon, uh, that's because it's, uh, when we talk about carbon, it's really used as a shorthand for carbon dioxide as well as methane, refrigerants, and other chemicals that are normalized um, uh, to be equivalent. And so if carbon dioxide is, um, is our, our baseline, right, other gases like methane, nitrous oxide, uh, perfluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, et cetera, all have different um, potencies uh, compared to carbon dioxide. So methane, right, is 21 times as potent as carbon dioxide, right? And that's gonna come from natural gas, um, uh, anaerobic decomposition, nitrous oxide, right? Comes from fertilizers. And when we talk about potency, you know, what we're really talking about is the ability of each of those gases to sequester a certain amount of uh, heat over a given period of time. Usually that time period is 100 years. And so, um, you know, uh, hydrofluorocarbons, right, are 11,700 times more potent than uh, carbon dioxide. Um, you know, methane measured over 100 years has a global warming potential of 21. That means that 1 million metric tons of methane is equivalent to 21 million metric tons of CO2. Um, and, you know, there's these, you know, re uh, refrigerants and gases, uh, they come from a wide range of sources. The ones that we have listed here are just the uh, um, six main ones targeted uh, in the um, Paris Accords. Um, but as I mentioned before, you know, methane comes from natural gas and anaerobic decompositions. Um, there's refrigerants, uh, nitrous oxide comes from fertilizers, um, and is also the result of combustion. Um, dentists also use nitrous oxide, uh, it's also known as laughing gas. Um, I'm making a personal commitment to sequester as much of that as possible uh, myself. I encourage you all to do what you can. So the, um, so we have these like huge numbers, right? Um, and, and what do they really mean, right? So uh, when we, so let's talk about carb, carbon equivalencies a little bit more. We know that a, a four person passive house, right? That the uh, operational energy limit for that is gonna be 15,360 kilowatt hours a year. Well, the, uh, that's gonna equal about 10.9 metric tons of, um, of CO2E, right? And that's gonna equal about uh, 2.3 cars driven for one year, or uh, 26,557 miles driven by an average car, or nine and a half trips from Florida to California. Just to give you an idea of um, what else would equal that same um, amount of carbon emissions. 
So it's also equivalent to 1,222 gallons of gasoline or 11,874 pounds of uh, coal being burned or 1,385,018 um, smartphone chargings, right? Uh, you know, we charge our cell phones every day. Um, but this is just uh, operational carbon, of course. And what we really want to focus on is the embodied carbon, right? So what do we mean when we talk about embodied carbon? Well, this is a, um, an image of uh, an ore mining operation. So this is uh, you know, a giant strip mine, um, and this ore is going to be turned into steel, right? So there's all sorts of intense uh, fuel usage and emissions associated with these massive furnaces. And even when we talk about a relatively low carbon material like wood, um, uh, you know, there's still a lot of associated carbon with it, whether it's from the harvesting, the milling, uh, the transportation, right? So even, a, and we're gonna get more into um, the carbon properties of wood in a little bit, but there's still, an associated carbon footprint, even with low embodied carbon materials. Um, and then there's also the end of life processes, which get factored into a materials embodied carbon footprint. Now, um, as we said, Passive House is fundamentally a tool to combat global climate change. And the scientific community has reached consensus that the earth must not be allowed to warm more than one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Our current um, position is, uh, you know, the Earth has warmed about one degree uh, Celsius, right? This is where, where we currently are. Uh, however, and I, I just learned this last year and it kind of blew my mind. This was from the October 16th, uh, 2019 uh, edition of the Washington Post. The headline is facing unbearable heat Qatar has begun to air condition the outdoors. And this was an article that was all about places um, that is already beyond the two degrees Celsius limit. Uh, and so unfortunately, as you can see from this little map, uh, a lot of that- David, is, it seems like we lost um, your audio. You can't hear me at all? Hello? I can hear you, David. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I hear um, you too. The reports coming in are that they can hear him fine. Okay. Okay. So I'll keep going. Okay. Um, so, uh, as you can see, um, uh, a lot of the areas up in the uh, northern hemisphere and around the Arctic Circle. So, some places have already surpassed um, that two degree threshold. Um, historically, right, embodied carbon has been responsible for 11% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions and 28% uh, of the building sector emissions globally. And uh, operational carbon has made up a much larger percentage of the overall um, carbon footprint. And so, you know, and so we focus, right? Uh, necessarily on reducing that operational carbon uh, footprint. Uh, the ratio of embodied carbon and operational carbon in a typical building is a little bit different than it is in a high performance building, right? So uh, as we drive down the overall carbon footprint because our buildings are more efficient on the operational side, embodied carbon starts to be a bigger uh, percentage of the overall uh, footprint. And so we're, we're used to saying, right, that passive houses save as much as 80% of the energy used by comparable buildings. Um, and this is true if the comparable buildings are based on an older version of code. Uh, in this study by Stephen Winters Associates, they found that the new codes are rapidly closing that gap with Passive House. So uh, when we compare Passive House to the 2015 IECC, 
right? We find that passive house is really about 25% better. And when we compare it to the 2018 IECC, it's only about 17% better. Now, this is actually a good thing, right? Because we want to see code continue to move towards passive house. And we want to see the cost delta between code and passive house continue to decrease. Uh, this shouldn't really be a surprise to anybody. Uh, this is actually consistent with the entire history of the energy code. It has always been moving towards zero, just like passive house, although passive house is, of course, moving towards zero a lot quicker uh, and really being a, 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 and pushing uh, the code along with it. So what this means is that the paradigm of our traditional ratio of operational to embodied carbon is changing. And that um, over the next 30 years, uh, once this coronavirus thing is behind us, um, we're going to build uh, an additional 19 and a half billion square feet per year. Now, when we put this slide together, uh, the projection was from 2020 to 2050. It might now be 2021 to 2051, but the point remains the same. Uh, and even though we've slowed down building temporarily, um, it's going to ramp um, back up. And that's going to have a, fundament, a fundamental um, change in the relationship between embodied and operational carbon. Because as we build ever more square footage, right, and ever more energy efficient buildings, and typical buildings become high performance buildings, the ratio is going to shift from 72% operational and 28% embodied to almost 50-50. But what this means is that we can't net zero our way uh, to sustainability and that we have to start uh, dealing with the uh, issue of um, embodied carbon in the same um, uh, both aggressive and progressive way that we've been that we've all been dealing with uh, uh, operational carbon. So um, we wanted to understand the uh, the distribution of embodied and operational carbon a little bit better on our own project. Uh, we've seen all these graphs, and we just wanted to see, okay, what does this really mean on what we are actually doing? So we, um, we set up our own case study with this uh, project. And um, this is a single family project in Chester County in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, it was designed by C2 Architecture and built by a Hugh Lofting high performance building. Um, and it's gonna be uh, C++ certified. Um, so we thought this is uh, a great example of um, where we as as architects and builders and everyone around us actually has uh, impact um, because the, typically the clients, the homeowners come to you with uh, very specific um, requirements. And in this case, it was um, they were very specific about the um, the size of the home and also uh, about the, the the design of this and. Um, as you can see, it doesn't really check the typical um, passive house kind of check boxes. So um, we knew the size and the shape of the house were pretty much non-negotiable. Um, but the, the owners, um, they were definitely very interested in um, energy efficient um, and in an energy efficient um, and comfortable home. Um, they are from Europe and have lived there for a long time, and they pretty much came out of a um, very drafty and uncomfortable home. So they, they're very open and um, um, want to, to build something um, with a high quality. So they're also very willing. Um, they're very adventurous and willing to just look at new approaches. And in this case, uh, we proposed uh, off-site manufacturing. Um, and a vapor open and foam free wall and, and roof assembly. And um, again, this is where we as architects and builders could truly make a difference uh, because we could propose um, something like this and we could follow through. And uh, this is definitely a more sustainable outcome than they probably would have reached 
otherwise. Um, and we do have to give the clients a lot of tr uh, credit for, um, you know, trusting, trusting us on this. So uh, for our case study, we uh, modeled our case and four other um, options uh, or cases in Woofy Passive and um, wanted to compare the um, operational usage. And I'm going to explain the, the difference in those, those um, uh, cases shortly. Uh, and then in order to figure out the, um, the embodied energy, we use Tally. And I think, Steve, you wanted to say a little bit about something about uh, Tally, right? Yeah, so the, um, the Tally software um, the, uh, that was actually developed by uh, Kieran Timberlake in Philadelphia um, with Autodesk, it's a plugin for Revit, and um, it's a quite a cost-effective plugin, and, and it, it was really, really great because we already had the Revit model from the project, and so we were able to sort of just bring in their libraries and build out these sort of additional material libraries that have all the embodied carbon and life cycle analysis data in them. Um, so you're going to see some of the results, but it was it was a critical piece to what we were trying to do here. You know, Oka worked with um, Wolfie to, to create the operational profile of the five cases, and then we used Tally to, to, to really nicely um, create the embodied carbon profiles. So these are our um, five cases. So case one and two are code compliant assemblies. And uh, based on a 2009 code, because that's what um, um, this, this was built, uh, finished last year. Um, but when we started, it was 2018, and Philadelphia was still um, following the 2009 code. Um, the difference between case one and case two is that for case two, we uh, upgraded the system to uh, passive health standards. Um, all cases, all five cases uh, use concrete for um, the, the basement or the um, yeah, basement area. And then the um, case three, we, um, we are meeting passive health standards, but uh, all the, the whole envelope has a, a pretty high foam content. Uh, case four is a uh, low foam um, approach, which we took in our actual um, build project. That means uh, everything above grade is uh, foam free. We used um, wood construction with cellulose uh, insulation and exterior wood fiber insulation. Uh, but for the um, below ground, we were still using ICS um, for forms. Um, then case five, we wanted to do better. So we looked at it um, and said, okay, how can we get rid of all the film? So we used the same um, above grade assemblies as um, case four, but then the below grade, again, we're still stuck with concrete, but on the exterior, we were um, assuming um, mineral wool. And then on the interior, we built a, um, a stud wall with cellulose um, insulation. And so <clears throat> um, we analyze, as Steve mentioned, we analyze each case uh, with Tally using their uh, default 60 year uh, LCA analysis time frame. And let's take apart these results a little bit. So the first thing that uh, we found was that by changing the systems, we could decrease the operational carbon by 54%. And then uh, by upgrading the envelope to a high foam passive house, we could further decrease the operational carbon by an additional 31%. So going from a, a, uh, a code compliant, but uh, high performance systems building to a full passive house um, uh, envelope and systems, we could reduce operational carbon uh, even more. However, what we did find, uh, unfortunately, is that we were actually increasing the embodied carbon by about 6%. 
However, when we go to just a, a, a low foam version of that passive house envelope, and as um, uh, as Ilka said, that this is version four, and, and that's actually what was built. Um, we're able to reduce the embodied carbon by 35% uh, as compared to a high foam passive house envelope. And if we go foam free, we can make a, a further 15% reduction in embodied carbon going from low foam to no foam. When we compare a high foam uh, to a foam free passive house envelope, that's actually a 45% reduction of embodied carbon uh, just by focusing on foam. Uh, so how so we, we went through this whole analysis and we were you know patting ourselves on the back and feeling pretty good about everything and then we realized you know this is a, a six this is an, this whole analysis was based on a, on a 60 year time scale which is crazy because we don't have 60 years right we have just over a decade uh, to deal with uh, the climate issue in order to avoid um, the worst effects. And so we reran the analysis and uh, on a 12 year time scale and said about comparing our results uh, between the, the, the 60 and the 12 year time scales. And so what we found um, was that even on version one, uh, which is just a code compliant building, uh, the ratio of embodied carbon shifts from 14% at 60 years to 12 per, to 37% at 12 years right and this makes sense because there's much less time uh for the operational carbon right to add up now when we looked at this again uh for case 2 uh this actually kind of surprised us and what we're seeing here is that already um, the uh, the upper, the um, embodied carbon is over half of the total carbon footprint, right? So we go from 26% in, um, embodied carbon at 60 years to 56% embodied carbon at 12 years. This is still a code compliant, uh, just a code envelope with high performance systems. And when we get into the passive house envelopes, right, we see the relationship almost become exactly inverted, where we shift from 35% uh, embodied carbon over 60 years to 66% embodied carbon over 12 years. And this um, relationship holds true in version four, right? Where embodied carbon makes up 61% of the total carbon footprint. Um, and in the foam free version, right, we see uh, the embodied carbon portion um, decrease a little bit. It goes down to 58%. But it just underscores the point that embodied carbon is a serious issue that needs to be tackled in the same smart and aggressive way that we've all been working on reducing operational energy. And so the question is, how do we do that, right? How do we intervene in these massive systems? And I really like um, the metaphor that the Living Building Challenge community uses a lot of the trim tab. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the trim tab is um, a part of the rudder it's like a little mini rudder uh, and because it's much smaller than, a, than than the main rudder it's easier to move it takes a real minimum uh, amount of effort to shift this little piece which then causes the uh, currents around it to shift which thereby makes it much easier to move the larger rudder and thereby turn the ship. So an example of this would be uh, back in um, 2014 or so when uh, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency um, adopted Passive House as part of their competitive scoring criteria, as part of the criteria that they use to 
um, grant tax credits to uh, fund pr uh, projects, right? Fund affordable housing projects. And because they put in just a, uh, a sentence or two in their um, scoring criteria, it had the effect of, of really jumpstarting um, and, and, and amplifying uh, pass, uh, you know, passive house within the affordable housing industry. Uh, now there's a ton of work in this sector, um, but just a few short years ago, uh, there wasn't. But then, um, you know, Tim McDonald, who many of you know, worked really hard to get it to get PHFA to um, uh, adapt, uh, adopt passive house, and they did, and it's moved on to other states, and it's really just been uh, an industry changing event. So, what are the other trim tabs that are out there? Where are the other levers where we can apply a minimum of effort for a maximum uh, effect? So when, when Ilka and I were working with the client and we were looking and costing how we were going to build the project in West Grove in Pennsylvania, we we um we decided to really focus. We didn't we didn't know the term or this awesome analogy trim tab, but we we decided to to focus on the the exterior wall and roof assemblies primarily with this trim tab. We already were were going to be implementing passive house strategies to address the operational carbon, but we we were interested in what what could we do. We knew about wood fiber. We'd known about it for a few years um, as it relates to CLT. And uh, we found out about Blueprint Robotics uh, around the same time, and we approached them, and uh, we said, you know, we really like your manufacturing um, capabilities. Would you be interested in completely retooling and and trying this these assemblies that are derived from some some really successful European assemblies? And they said yes. So we were like, oh, awesome. Um, so this is Blueprint Robotics. Um, they, this is actually a picture of our first uh, series of walls uh, on that project running through um, their wall bridge. On this machine or this, this line here, they basically handle the framing and sheathing, nailing and precise um, geometry routing for openings and perimeter and seam panel splices. Um, the plant is, is organized around simultaneous wall floor and roof panel production lines. There are no standardized size panels being produced. Rather, every panel is, is just customized to deliver custom project um, design intent. So what we, we've kind of learned, and we, we had a hunch, but we've learned is that the, the, there's some really important benefits um, when we're talking about body energy that come out of this type of offsite manufacturing if you you kind of combine these low carbon, high performance assemblies through this kind of an op, a, a process. So, so some of them I'm going to just kind of go through a little bit. So one of them is there is an extreme reduced waste per um, that happens because they are what what a CNC line likes is they like long ribbons of really good straight wood. So that means that there's a very limited uh, amount of waste like a, a tiny amount of waste because they basically are taking both engineered and solid lumber and they're just cutting parts out of it. So rather than, you know, finding and optimizing part lengths out of nominal lengths, they're, they're really just sort of getting what they need um, from, from these long parts. And, and the machines also really require a very uh, precise and accurate uh, dimension because the machines have a zero reference point on in three axes and they just need to know that the wood's actually going to be where it needs to be. And so they end up sourcing some quite good lumber. I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Another uh, really cool benefit that we feel really adds to the, the, the sort of the efficiency and reduces carbon is the fact that they apply these repeatable conditions like, you know, re they're repeatable, um, installation methods like repeatable window installs, uh, repeatable corners, but they apply those to pretty much endless geometry. And so there's less time in the field, there's less um, vehicles being driven, there's less waste, and all those things kind of 
relate back to sort of a more streamlined uh, low embodied carbon just production, right? Um, next one, David. Or yeah, that's good. So um, you know this this actually shows. Oh, actually, you know, go, go back. Can you just go back up to the uh, lumber shot? Awesome, thank you. So, so another benefit is that, and this is important. When we looked at the the embodied carbon of a wooden building, um, you know, there there's a lot there's a, there's a lot of benefits and talk about sequestration in wooden assemblies, which is all accurate only if you actually have certified sourced lumber, because the minute that you sort of just overlook that requirement, then you you really can't claim almost any sequestration benefits because if you're just buying lumber from without reliable sustainable sourcing um, that's been vetted, then you really you may have a humongous embodied carbon footprint on that piece of lumber, and therefore you, you would completely negate the, the benefit of the sequestration. So we learned pretty quickly, and then and found out very early with Blueprint Robotics as just one option that all of their lumber comes from um, a FSC and PFC certified lumber source that they they get their stuff from Austria from Store Enzo. So there's pretty big benefits knowing that literally every stick of lumber, not sheathing, but every stick of lumber in the building is certified. And that means that we can claim that credit for the sequestration. So that was a big learning thing for us. And then the other thing is that because they bring that through sort of an optimized or shared lumber transportation uh, method, which is a container ship from a single source with port to port. So Baltimore has a port, their, their, their factory is literally, you can see the port from their factory. Um, even though it still has to come across the Atlantic in a container ship, the carbon footprint significantly lower than all of the, the transportation in, um, uh, footprint that comes from pretty much everything we source in the U.S. under normal construction. So, okay, jump to that last one with the uh, cellulose. Yeah. So another benefit would be things like, you know, just the cellulose, cellulose being packed. I mean, there, there's every square or, or uh, volumetric inch of, of cellulose and all their other materials are really quantified in a way that is required by CNC production that is just not required. So um, just from an embodied carbon standpoint, but also just as a design checkpoint, you sort of need to model to such a level of degree that it, it, it gives us an opportunity to actually quantify rather than just sort of guesstimate what our energy impact is and what our material usage is. So we, we do need to do more work on this, but the cool thing for us is that we have ridiculous quantifiable uh, volumes and, you know, through a, a pretty much a manufacturing BIM type model, we're able to see exactly what, it, what, what we designed in it. And because of their process, um, it, it ends up landing in the building. And then the final thing I wanted to say was that I really like about, and I think this relates to embodied carbon, is that CNC panelized construction um, does not penalize uh, a budget or construction schedule for unique geometry conditions versus simple formulaic kind of Lego parts. So what I mean by that is if you take a, a panelized system that's, that's basically standard size walls and windows and all that, it seems like it makes sense or even a modular system. But the reality is that if you have a line like this, that's a CNC line, the CNC routers and machines could care less if you're cutting a hundred parts that are identical or a hundred different parts. They don't mind because they have their machine file and it's all coming from, you know, a long strip of lumber. So there's actually not an additional cost for the most part uh, for customized. And the thing I like about that is that it means that we can actually get quite innovative and not necessarily squander either design, you know, beauty or uh, passive house design intent, geometry that works well with the site, all those things are completely unhindered by cost and, um, you know, because of this CNC process. So that's another thing that we like. I think that's pretty much. Oh, and then we were going to just talk about, yeah, this next slide, David. So, you know, real quickly, we, we like we said, we, we focused on this project for the analysis on replacing the foam 
um, with the wood fiber. Next. And we found that it was quite an impressive um, reduction in body carbon. We went from, on that layer of the building, we went from, um, from a fairly decent carbon load to um, a full sequestration. Next. Yeah, that's Zilka. So, um, yeah, so we just wanted to sum up our findings. Um, and um, so this, is, this pretty much shows very clearly um, the reduction overall for the um, foam-free passive house versus the high foam passive house. Um, and um, pretty much everything stays the same. We just, pre we just took the whole number seven, that was 17% uh, before in the high form uh, foam passive house, which is the thermal and moisture protection out of the whole kind of, out of the whole pie. So overall we're reducing, but what really shows is that um, now the concrete, this yellow pie, piece is getting enormous. Um, while it was four, before like 46%, now all of a sudden in this uh, reduced scenario, we're looking at 64%. And um, yeah, I mean, we thought this is, this is becoming, we, we've done our part here on one, one trim tab, and this is definitely becoming the next big um, elephant in the room. And that's what we wanted to focus on next. And so um, we decided to continue uh, with the analysis um, by doing a, a little thought experiment to see how far down uh, we could drive the embodied carbon in the concrete. And through our research, um, we found that kiln types um, make a difference. So the manufacture of um, Portland cement can be done in different ways, and that there's wet kilns, uh, long dry, dry with preheater, and dry with preheater and pre-calciner. And that dry with preheater and pre-calciner kilns use on an average of 85% less energy than wet kilns. And I know that this is, um, you know, much deeper than we would typically look into material specifications um, if we want to tackle embodied carbon i think that it's worth you know looking into our local sources and seeing where their supplies come from and seeing if they're you know if we do have an option let's say of two different uh local concrete plants um you know perhaps one gets their portland cement from a better source than another and we can work on specifying that um, another interesting product that we came across is from this company called Carbon Cure. Um, and Carbon Cure basically is that what they do is they take atmospheric carbon, they liquefy it, and then they inject it um, into the concrete mix. Um, and they say that. Um, uh, every, every time I go to the uh, go to their website, they're constantly taking their, their numbers, which is interesting. Um, and there's a lot of different um, carbon cure um, plants available around the country, so it's worth looking at because there might be one near you. Um, here's a, you know a couple that were near DC. Um, for those of you in that area, and you know, I got really excited. We got really excited about this, and then I read on their website that Carbon Cure only saves an average of five percent of concrete derived CO2, and so that was actually a little bit disappointing because it didn't seem that much. However, what they also say is that as, uh, this has probably been updated on their website since I um, since I got this information. Um, which was a few months ago now, but they said as of January 2019, two million cubic yards of concrete have been produced collectively by Carbon Cure's partners with injected CO2, achieving the milestone of diverting 44 million pounds of CO2 from the atmosphere. 
the same amount of CO2 sequestered by 23,508 acres of U.S. forests in one year. And so that made me rethink that 5% number, um, you know, which at first seemed quite low, but when you aggregate it with all of the um, projects that they're involved with seems to, you know, potentially make, be able to make quite a difference. Uh, so that's something that I encourage you all to um, look into. It's definitely something that uh, we're looking into uh, more as well. There's also the old um, tried and true uh, substitution technique of using either fly ash or slag. And um, typically, um, uh, you can substitute about 40 to 50 percent of fly ash or slag um, into your concrete mix um, and thereby reduce the embodied carbon of your concrete. And really the limiting factor here tends to be structural engineers. Um, a lot of them feel comfortable with 40 percent at this point. I have, I did read about a project that uh, just substituted, I think, 80% blast furnace slag. Um, we're working on a project right now uh, and had a conversation with the structural engineers last week, and they're going to look at the amount of um, flash and slag that they feel comfortable substituting within each assembly, because the slabs will have uh, one threshold, the uh, foundation walls will have another. And because those elements are poured at different times, um, we can specify either higher or lower amounts of fly ash and slag substitution uh, by the assembly instead of having to just take a lowest common denominator. Um, sometimes when this comes up, people will say, well, you know, we don't want to encourage um, like say the production of coal, which is where fly ash comes from. Um, I don't think we're in danger of doing that. More than 65% of fly ash uh, is currently disposed of in landfills. Um, so there's, you know, there's approximately 40 million tons of um, unused fly ash in the U.S. Um, so I think that we can find ways to increase our use before we um, worry about encouraging coal production. Um, and yeah, this, this would equal about a 42 to 46% reduction, um, in greenhouse gas emissions, um, just through, uh, a, a typical substitution of flash and slag. And so we decided to, um, add these up, uh, and to see what we can reduce our overall carbon footprint by, but, uh, but we're doing it very conservatively, right? So. We start off with 64% of our total carbon footprint is still in the um, concrete. Now, if we just take um, uh, a 15% re reduction, right, in the concrete from you know a, a better sourced Portland cement, we're able to reduce that total um, by 10%. And if we decide, okay, and we're going to, you know, also use carbon cure, and we're, so we're going to reduce that by uh, further 5%, which equals a 12% total reduction from our original footprint. And let's say we're, again, being conservative and we're only substituting 20% of our uh, Portland cement with fly ash or slag. That's going to equal um, a total 30% reduction in our overall carbon footprint. So we've taken our original uh, 120,633 kilograms of CO2e and reduced it down to 84,638 kilograms of CO2e. Right again, total of a 30% reduction just by taking really, really conservative um, reduction measures. So this isn't nearly as radical uh, as we could be. And each of these steps is 
um, most likely carb, um, uh, cost neutral. There may be some premium for uh, um, carbon cure, uh, but it's probably pretty minor and absorbable uh, into the project. And so we haven't even begun to dealt with, you know, woods and plastics and openings and finishes and the other um, kind of con concentrations of embodied carbon. And so really this comes down to the power of specifications um, and that by doing some uh, thinking ahead of time, uh, we can build some of this into uh, into the project in the beginning. Um, again, I'm having conversations in design development phase right now with the structural engineers um, to try to reduce the carbon footprint of our concrete um, and doing that now. We're going to get that in the specs. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, shouldn't see a, a big cost impact uh, from, from that, if any. But we know it'll be a better project. So this is the this is the one of the latest projects that we um, have completed the envelope. This is a 10,000 square foot um, shared caretaker space and residence. Um, there's some space in the ICF basement that will be used for charity foundation uh, fundraising. Um, <clears throat> but it's just another example of you know pretty much completely custom uh, project that was it was. Tag. This was actually with Revision Architects, um, and they chose to, to go with the Holzer envelope. We, this was going to be a passive house, uh, and it will be a certified passive house. So it was. It already had a really great operational carbon target. But again, just you know, making a selection like that on this on the uh, what type of, of envelope you're going to specify has made a tremendous um, impact on a project like this. So we. We just really we're we're seeing and we're just sort of you know asking everybody to really understand that there there's humongous power that everybody has, including the architect, the builder, um, you know the homeowner, the developer. Everybody can really just immediately get these uh, impactful choices made. And you know if you look at them early on and you you do some analysis early on, there are ways to find that you know that make them important and then you can try to, to readjust some of the other elements in the building so that you can still make these budgets work and i think the more we're finding already that the more we do these projects we're finding ways to, to bring the cost down so you know these projects are completely competitive we're bidding against other passive house envelopes so it's just a really important thing for us all to know that that everyone now that you know that you have you have these objects, find these trim tabs, and um, well, I think David's going to show you a couple more uh, examples of some people that are that are choosing to to try this. Um, this is a project by Tim McDonald um, that hopefully sometime later in the year. I guess we have a little delay now, but he'll be using similar envelope, the Holstrom envelope, on uh, this 88 unit certified passive house apartment in Philadelphia. Um, there's another project that's looking to do a, sim a similar assemblies through Blueprint Robotics, also in Philadelphia area. So, anyway, we're excited. We appreciate the uh, the chance to talk about some of these things. All right, thank you. Um, and if there's any questions, James, I don't know if we have, do we have time to take a few. If there are any. Yeah, I think I think we can do another. Because we did start a little bit late, we'll we'll do about ten minutes of questions or so. Um, I'll try and parse that back through. I see Christopher has been marking a few um, to ask along the way. I'll probably start with the ones hopefully that are easiest to answer, and then when we get to the tougher ones, um, we'll go ahead and mark those. And and David and and Ilka and Steve, if if it's possible, we'll try and send you those, and maybe you guys can provide your answers and text form. Does that sound okay? Definitely. Okay, let's see. So we've got this one uh, might hopefully be easy. Um, can you differentiate between CO2E and global warming potential? 
Um, so there, um, I would say that they're basically the um, the the I'd say that they're basically um, equivalent terms. Um, I think that there's a little bit more uh, potential nuance in CO2e, right? Um, but we're basically talking about the global warming potential of different gases when we talk about CO2e. So if, um, I guess global warming potential is gonna be the specific number, right? Whereas um, CO2e is the uh, equivalent term, right? So if, um, let's say methane, I believe is 21 times as potent as carbon dioxide, the global warming potential um, for um, methane is, is 21. Um, and then the um, CO2e is going to be basically the specific amount of methane um, multiplied 21 times. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Yep. I think that's that's a fine answer for me, at least. Let's see. Next question we got. Hopefully. Okay. This one is for Steve, I believe. Um, why do you use um, why why do you not use U.S. timber versus European? Uh, I have no problem using U.S. timber. I I actually um, I've been using U.S. mostly West Coast timber in our timber frame projects for 25 years, and I'm a big fan of it. I also think there are awesome resources of standing dead. Um, material and so I'm excited to find out that actually there are groups that are are actively um, investing in and in planning production of wood fiber insulation and we already do have access to FSC certified lumber so when when we found out from Blueprint Robotics that for them um, their import strategy was from Store Enzo it really created a very clean path well, let me put it another way. My experience through the timber frame world over the last, say, the last 15 years when FSC started to become specified for our commercial projects was that it was outrageously expensive and actually quite difficult to source. And it, it sort of left out some of the local um, mills and industries because some of the hoops at the time that were required to, for a small mill to get uh, through a certification would basically run them out of business. So it it it, it was really um, quite common to see the FSC spec, and then we watched it kind of wane a bit. And so what's really nice now is that I feel like it's coming back, but what's great for us right now is that we know that we can source until it becomes more affordable in states. We can source uh, the material that comes from this particular plant in Austria and there's a few others over there. They're sort of ahead of the curve a little bit on it, so they 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 can offer it at a much more cost-effective um, price, and that really is a pretty big thing when you're trying to already sell the premium of passive house to people. If there's a, a, a way for us to get sustainably sourced materials and not not add another huge price tag on it, it's really important. It just so happens that the carbon footprint of sourcing that material and transporting it actually is quite a bit lower too than bringing it in from a complex web of trucking that is what brings all of our standard lumber. So that's that's one reason why right now, but I really would, I'm really hoping and, and I'm excited about being able to, to you know, reduce the import. I mean, we, we'd love to reduce the import on all, everything in our assemblies and in our projects, we would love to, including windows. We're actively looking for window makers that can deliver passive house um, to work with. We are absolutely open to, to not just wood fiber, but other um, non-foam insulation types. And we, we are really, really excited uh, to see the North American suppliers uh, jump in this market. Great. Thank you for that answer. 
David, I've got a request. Could could you uh, bring up the the code and for the CEUs again, so people can get that info? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Here you go. Thank you much. Um, and then we've got a question. One more question for Steve. Um, where is the Holzrum plant? Where are you guys working out of, Steve? The Holzrum is a design firm that um, we. The plant is right now. We're working with Blueprint Robotics. Um, the goal for Holzrum is to really be a design bridge between, um, you know, design intent for projects and uh, passive health and the proper off-site manufacturing um, uh, resource. And so right now we have a really great thing going with Blueprint Robotics, but we see the future of off-site high-performance manufacturing. It's already coming online. I mean, there's some other great companies that are coming up on the East Coast. Um, we, we, Ilka and I kind of, we, we see ourselves as sort of experts in what does it take to get a Revit model with design intent completely through and modeled and, and all the passive house elements brought in and structural engineering and MEP perspectives, um, all kind of coordinate into what we call single integrated manufacturing model. And so we take, we sort of are that bridge where we're a connector, um, bringing projects to off-site manufactured passive house and with low carbon. Awesome. Um, I think we got time for a couple more questions. This one might be short depending on the answer. Um, have, have any of you done any modeling between adaptive reuse of an existing building versus new construction in terms of carbon footprints? Um, we have not done that yet. Um, and it's certainly something we're interested in. Um, I would say that, you know, in general, I think, we, you know, everyone sort of could, knows it intuitively, right? I mean, the, one of the best ways to reduce the embodied carbon footprint is to reuse materials. Um, and I, you know, there would certainly be significant, um, embodied carbon savings um in reusing an existing building as opposed to you know knocking it down and um uh, uh knocking down a building new and i think that those kind of calculations um you know if you're doing them um are really important when it comes to telling the story about the project um maybe selling reuse as an option right if a client is perhaps on the fence and perhaps embodied carbon is something they care about um uh, you know that would be at least one um kind of set of criteria that you could use to make the case to um reuse a building as opposed to um, knocking it down Yep. And I, I also think, think it's just taking this uh, a step, like our analysis, a step further, because um, you know we've we've set this up because we, or in this presentation, we know most of what we're asking, <laughs> but with um, use use buildings, it's it's definitely kind of a step more complicated. So maybe that will be our next goal. Awesome. Okay, I think we're just about wrapped up. Um, just a reminder to everybody that there will be a follow-up email with uh, certificate information. I want to thank our thank our presenters very much, David, Steve, Ilka. Fantastic job! Um, again, we will try and follow up with uh, uh, some more answers to some of the more in-depth questions, and we'll we'll forward that guys that to you. Um, the webinar will be available for rewatching. We did record it. Um, Again, thank you, everybody. Uh, and yeah, we can wrap up. Very good job. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank so you, much. James. Thank, thank, thank you, you. Stephen Olka. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.